Hi, my name is Scott Simpson, and today I'll be talking about how to use the WebMO graphical user interface, or GUI. So WebMO is a software package that's utilized so you can easily interact with quantum chemical software packages, such as Gaussian, or uh, Games, or VASP. And what it allows you to do is, is rather than go in through the command line, like you might see, uh, like this is an example of a command line. Uh, this is how people interact with the quantum chemical codes. But uh, when it comes to our usage, I would prefer if the students would just have an easy interface, easy access to this. So uh, to do this, what you'll need to do is, is you'll need to get to your WebMO portal. Uh, depending on what school you attend, this will be different, but the address for ours is located up here, should also be in your user manuals. The other way you know that you've reached the St. Bonaventure University WebMO login is, as you'll see, St. Bonaventure University written here. Next, what you'll have to do is fill in your username and password that will be given to you before the start of class. Uh, you hit login. And what should happen is, is it will take you to a new page. In this case, we have nothing uh, in our queue or in our job manager. This will eventually list all the jobs that have been completed. And what I mean by a job is a calculation. So calculation and job are used synonymously. So now let's go to start a new job. What we'll want to do is, is we'll want to click the new job option up in the corner and we'll want to click create new job. We do not want to click import or execute input file. Uh, those are other uh, inputs that you can do. We want to just go with the generic WebMO one. So let's create, click new login. Next, we have this build molecule screen that comes up. And what we can do is, is we can actually build a molecule. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to build benzene. So, or let, let's build a uh, phenol. So that's benzene with a hydroxyl on it. So now the next thing we want to do is, is we want to change our atom types. So initially I started clicking and I had carbon selected. If I go to build the, the periodic table function, I can select a different element. So we said phenol, so we want a hydroxide. So I'm going to click that and I'll put an oxygen off one of those carbons. Now the other problem becomes is, is we need to change these from double bonds to single bonds, or excuse me, from single bonds to double bonds. So let's do that, change a couple of them. There we go. Next, if you look, we're missing quite a bit of hydrogen. So what we could do is, is we could click this periodic table, uh, we could click hydrogens and start drawing them in. But there is actually a neat user interface that you can do to uh, deal with this. You can click add hydrogens. If we do that, it'll add hydrogens. But if you look, our geometry still doesn't look too good. So what we could do is, is we could do clean up, we could do clean up geometry, or we could do mechanics optimize. If we do that, there we go. Our system looks way better. So now we have a system constructed. If we hit the next tab, the continue tab over in the bottom right, it's going, sometimes it'll ask if it's completely symmetric. So uh, the calculation prefers symmetry. You can make the molecule symmetric by clicking that button over here. In most cases, you don't have to worry about it though. You could just click okay. Next, we have the choose computational engine option. And what this option is, is it is deciding what software package, what quantum code are you going to use to simulate your system? So in, at our school, we have uh, two that are available. We have games and we have Gaussian. We're gonna select Gaussian for our system. Uh, then if you have different queues, our system only has one queue right now, the Slayer queue. So we'll select that. So now what we've told uh, the, the graphical user interface is, is we want uh, to use Gaussian and we want to use the geometry that we've input and we're going to use this this computer cluster called Slayer. We'll hit next. What comes up next are a bunch of different job options. What I'm going to do is I'm gonna walk through each of them and explain what each of these job options are. So the job name, this is the name that uh, your job will have while it's in the queue. And what the queue is, is 
It's the, the list of calculations that are going into the computer cluster. So I have a computer cluster that has many processors on it, many different computers. What happens is, is your calculations wait in line they, until they reach a point where they can go onto the computer cluster, they get crunched and they spit data back. So the job name is, is what it's going to look like when it's, when it's in the queue and when the calculation is conducted. And afterwards, when you go back to your job manager, you're going to see that name. So let's give it um, a somewhat detailed name. You do not want this to have any spaces. So no spaces in the name, always use underscore or dashes and you do not want this to start with a number. There's a lot of issues that can happen uh, by doing this, it has to deal with the queuing system that we're using. Uh, so the, the thing that controls how the calculations go into the computer cluster. So let's change the name, let's change it to phenol, and let's do uh, PBE, and I'll explain what PBE is in a minute. Next, we have the calculation option. There's a bunch of di different calculations you can choose. Molecular energy calculations are calculations that are just going to tell you what is the energy of that system that you've inputted. This typically is not too useful because what you're trying to do is, is trying to get to the ground state geometry. You want the system to become optimized to be at the lowest energy it possibly can. So uh, to do that, we wanna do a geometry optimization. We also have vibrational frequencies which is a, a calculation where it'll take whatever you're inputting and it'll calculate the vibrations, assuming a harmonic oscillator, what, uh, how to get those bonds to move around. So we're, we're gonna do something like that in a moment. Um, it will also get, simulate the IR spectrum if you're in organic chemistry. Optimized plus vibrational frequencies does a geometry optimization and a vibrational frequency optimization. Another good part about vibrational frequencies is it lets you know if you're at the local minimum, if you have no imaginary frequencies. So you know you have a good structure if that's the case. You might be asking, why don't you always do a vibrational frequency calculation? They tend to be more costly or more computationally expensive, meaning they take more computer time to go through. We also have excited states and UV viz. So you, if you want to simulate the UV viz spectrum, you can do that. NMR, so if you want to get NMR signals, you can do that. And then there are a bunch of transition state searches that I'm not going to really discuss right now. So let's do optimized plus vibrational frequency. Next is the theory. So there are several different theories you can use to approximate uh, the electron-electron interaction uh, or other, other ways to simulate the system. They're different uh, quantum chemical models. So the ones that are generally found in Gaussian or hartree fock Next, there's a large list of a bunch of acronyms like B3, LYP, PBE, and so on. These are density functionals. So there's DFT, density functional theory, which operates a little bit different than hartree fock hartree fock tends to get uh, what is known as exact exchange, where DFT, it can supposedly get uh, exact exchange and correlation if you have the universal functional. Uh, what are exchange and correlation? Exchange has to deal with making sure that the electrons are completely indistinguishable from one another. The more that you can distinguish them, the more an energetic penalty you have to pay, and that just falls out of quantum mechanics. Correlation is, is the fact that uh, electron number one, if there is a three electron system, electron number one influences electron number two over here, which influences electron number three over here. So they're all interconnected. And the problem becomes is, is you have um, way too many unknowns. If number one depends on the position of two and three, but two depends on the position of electron three and electron one, and it creates very complex mathematics that we currently don't have the ability to solve. So hartree fock again, gets exact exchange. DFT, uh, if we had the universal functional, could get exact exchange and correlation, but we don't have that. So it doesn't work out in that case. So uh, what they do is, is they approximate these things. So depending on what functional you select, you're gonna get different energies and you might get a better or worse answer. How do you know which functional to use? Well, you usually calculate some property that you're interested in and you see how does it, how does it work out uh, if you have some experimental data. Then you hope 
to your new system that might not have any experimental data, you calculate it and hope it works out. You kind of get a feel for these things as you use them more often. Then we have MP2, which is another type of theory which builds on hartree fock that can, it's a um, related to perturbation theory. Uh, we have coupled cluster, and then we have semi-empirical methods down here. The one that we're gonna select is PBE, so we're doing a density functional theory calculation. The next thing is, is the basis set. So the basis set, uh, this is an, um, basically, a mathematical function to describe the atomic orbitals. So we know the atomic orbitals, they overlap, they create molecular orbitals. Uh, you want to use a basis set that's good. How do you, but as you increase the complexity of that basis set, which increases the quality of that basis set, you also increase computational expense. So um, you could ask for the best basis set possible, but the problem becomes your calculation is going to take exponentially longer amounts of time. So you kind of have to do a balancing act with these. Uh, the one we're going to choose is basic, uh, just so we can get the calculation to run through throughout the uh, the in a relatively quick time. Next is the total charge on the system. So if you if we had uh, an extra electron, we get a negative one charge. If we had uh, two electrons, negative two charge. If we had one less electron, a positive one charge. Next is the multiplicity. So this is the spin state of the system. Uh, basically, if you have all paired electrons, you should have a multiplicity of a singlet generally. Uh, if you, you always wanna check these to make sure that they're correct. A lot of times you may wanna charge on the system, so, but the multiplicity won't be a singlet. Make sure to match those things. Next, in the advanced tab, there's a bunch of different options. We could include a solvent. So uh, if you wanted to do the calculation in water or acetonitrile, any of these things are possible. Uh, the other thing that you may sometimes run into a problem with is, is Cartesian coordinates. I usually click that on. I usually click off include connectivity. This can sometimes fix many of the problems you might see. Okay. So next, uh, if you hit the preview tab, you don't have to do this, but this is actually the input that the computer is seeing. So all of this information is uh, what the, what gain, or excuse me, what Gaussian is seeing to run through the calculation. WebMO just prepares it for you. So if you look, that's what the raw output, or raw input, excuse me, looks like. We hit continue. It's gonna say, uh, this will submit the edited input file. We hit okay. Okay, so now if you look, our calculation is sitting there, it's queued. If we hit refresh a couple times, it should eventually move from being queued to running. So right now it's going through the calculation, okay? Let's go through that quickly one more time. Let's do another system, and then we'll check back on our uh, results in a moment. So let's build another system. Uh, let's build, let's do Mercaptan. So Mer Mercaptan stinks. Uh, this is the structure for it. Let's build it in WebMO. So we have our carbon already selected. We need a sulfur. There we go. Now we could draw in the hydrogens. Uh, we could click add hydrogens and so on. If we hit uh, comprehensive mechanics, what it'll do is, is it'll saturate our system with hydrogens and pre-optimize our system. So there we go, we have our captain. We can symmetrize it and we hit next. Okay, we wanna go with Gaussian, we want to run Slayer, hit next. Uh, let's change this to Mercaptain. We'll change the calculation type. We'll do, just do a geometry optimization in this case. Level of theory, let's go with B3LIP. So let's change that name to B3LYP. Let's keep the same basis set. Advanced, we wanna turn on Cartesian coordinates, turn off connectivity. And let's say we wanna conduct this in water. We hit next and our calculation is going. Okay, now, that's, that's a quick and dirty way of how to do it. Uh, now we can look at the output of our phenol that we previously submitted. So let's check this out. 
So if we click on this system, this is the optimized geometry. We can rotate this molecule around if we want to look at it. Uh, if we want to see what the computer actually did, if you look at the geometry sequence energy, which is below uh, the molecular viewer, we can see what the computer did. It started modifying some of these bonds to get to that low point in energy. And we can see what happened to the energy over time with that plot. So as we do this, if we look, our energy started much higher and eventually it worked its way down to its, its local minimum. Okay, other information that we have. If we look along in here, we get a, a, a wealth of information. Uh, we can see the stoichiometry, so the molecular formula of this system, the symmetry, the basis set that we use, this energy along here, this RPBE, PBE energy, that's the energy of the system. That's typically what you want. Uh, depending on what uh, theory you're using, like let's say we're using Hartree-Fock, we'll see HF energy here. Or if we're using a different type of theoretical models, uh, we will have uh, different energies that appear there. Another interesting thing that we'll see is, is the dipole moment. So if you look, this can give us an idea of uh, how polar or nonpolar our system is. And if you look, you can actually view where is the dipole moment pointing. And so that little arrow shows us the dipole moment. Next, as we keep scrolling down, we get to vibrational modes. So these are the modes, if we, if we hit our system with IR radiation, how are they vibrating? So let's look at uh, this vibration, where in that case, it's the OH wagon like that. So you can see this is uh, where, when we, when we hit our system with IR radiation, this causes that specific bond to move. And that's kind of the idea behind quantum mechanics. Things are quantized. We hit it with that level of energy, and that's going to start happening. If we want to simulate our, our IR spectrum, we can go down from our vibrational modes, hit that IR spectrum, and look at that, and there you go. Okay. So uh, another spot that you might be interested in is uh, this, this all gets extracted from the raw output. So I'm not showing you the whole story here. If we click the raw output, this is actually the output that comes from our quantum chemical software. And there's a lot of information in here. Uh, WebMO basically tries to parse out the most useful information, but sometimes it doesn't get it all. So if we scroll down, you can see that there's a ton of info in here. And in some cases, you might actually have to go in and look for that raw output and see what it has to state. All right. So with that, that's about all I wanted to discuss. Uh, if you have any questions about using WebMO, please let me know. Uh, and I'd be happy to answer your questions. Thank you.